It is truly a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you today about the role of regenerative rehabilitation in helping to move forward our field's vision towards a functional future. My name is Fabrizio Ambrosio. I am an associate professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the University of Pittsburgh and director of rehabilitation for UPMC International. In the light of the intentions of this Rehab 2020 vision meeting, I wanted to use the next 20 minutes to discuss directed steps that I think we as a field can and should pursue with the goal of maximizing regenerative rehabilitation's impact, efficiency, and sustainability. For a long time, we called this field emerging, and emphasis was really placed on making a case for why it is that scientists across the domains of regenerative medicine and rehabilitation should be talking more, interacting more, and collaborating more. But in the last 10 years, since the concept of regenerative rehabilitation was first introduced, the field has made important and exciting progress. And I think now there's generally a widespread acceptance that synergizing these two fields just makes sense. Instead, we now find ourselves less needing to make a case for regenerative rehabilitation. And the task before us is how to move forward this field such that we can really optimize its potential. Whereas this objective is only logical, the much more challenging question then becomes how to further elevate the harmony between these two interventional approaches with the goal of maximizing functional outcomes for our patients. There is a powerful and fundamental principle in the musical world, and particularly in the stringed instruments, that is a target when striving for the best sound possible. That is a phenomenon of resonance. Achieving this quality of resonance represents what I think is a very interesting and tangible metric of optimization efforts. And that is because the key features of a resonance system include a long lasting and maximized impact that is achieved through the most efficient use of the energy or effort applied. As an example, acoustic resonance represents that sweet spot where the musician imposes an impulse on the string just right, such that the vibrations that emerge align perfectly with the natural frequency of a completely separate but neighboring string. What results of the two vibrations working together is this greatly amplified sound, a sound that is capable of propag uh, propagating over time and swelling even the biggest of music halls. How is this relevant to regenerative rehabilitation? Regenerative rehabilitation represents a convergence of two separate fields, regenerative medicine and rehabilitation. Regenerative medicine employs technologies such as stem cell therapeutics, biologics, or tissue engineering devices with the goal of restoring tissue and organ function that has been lost after injury or in the setting of disease. A major advance in the field of regenerative medicine has been the increased recognition of the potential of mechanical stimuli, electrical stimuli, thermal st stimuli to enhance stem cell function and therefore the therapeutic benefit. A good example is the use of bioreactors, which are often used to prime stem cells in a culture dish so as to make them more amenable to promoting regeneration, even following transplantation into a host. The growing appreciation of the importance of extrinsic biophysical stimuli for dictating stem cell behavior has naturally then turned attention to the clinical field with expertise in modulation of the tissue microenvironment with the goal of promoting tissue healing and functional recovery. Rehabilitation. Until, until now, we have used a Venn diagram to represent these two fields coming together and regenerative rehabilitation resided in that space in between. But I think the time is right for us to move away from thinking of rehabilitation simply in digital terms. That is the addition or not of a rehabilitation protocol as we add these stem cell therapeutics and tissue engineering devices. And instead, perhaps it's time to really start to focus our efforts on refining the protocols such that we can get them just right and to maximize the outcomes that result. And this really represents this new concept of optimizing the resonance in the field of regenerative rehabilitation. And this is the goal of the NIH-funded Alliance for Regenerative Rehabilitation Research and Training, 
art, as we like to call it, is now entering into its fifth year. And you can see here the team, which consists of Tom Rando at Stanford University, Mike Boninger at Pitt, and myself, we serve as co-principal investigators. Carmen Terzik at the Mayo Clinic and Linda Noble-Hosslein at the University of Texas, Austin, are site PIs. And on the far left here, you see Dr. Laura Miller, who is our fearless senior program manager. Art's goal is to accelerate the pace of discovery by supporting investigators that are working at the cutting edge of regenerative rehabilitation investigations. And I'd like to share with you just some of the projects that we have funded in these first five years since our inauguration. We start from the most fundamental scientific level. So whereas the potential of extrinsic biophysical forces to guide stem cell behavior is very well established, our ability to truly refine regenerative rehabilitation regimens demands an enhanced understanding of how varying magnitudes of extrinsic forces may differentially affect stem cell responses. To this end, ART has supported and is very excited about the work of Dr. Spencer Chesney and his laboratory at Penn State University. And together, Spence and his group are developing novel technologies to better understand how tenocytes respond to varying mechanical loads within their native microenvironment. So they have developed a tendon explant model, and this tendon explant model is outfitted with a bioreactor system that is capable of applying cycl cyclical tensile loads to the live tendon in the dish. Cells within the tendon are labeled such that they can be tracked with a confocal microscope. And this therefore allows for measurement of the displacement fields of the cells within the tendon and thereby derivation of the local tissue strains. The true beauty of the system, I think, is that they have engineered the tenocytes such that gene expression changes are visualized using a fl fl fluorescence reporter, essentially providing a real-time readout of cell responses to loading. Now, given that microscale cell and tissue responses to loading will ultimately titrate up to macroscale responses dictating the efficacy of our interventions, it's expected that the information gained from these studies will ultimately help inform the prescription of regenerative rehabilitation protocols for the treatment of tendon injuries or degeneration. Many of these questions are also being asked in the context of other pathologies for which the development of cellular therapeutics are further advanced along the translational pipeline. And a good example of this is stroke research. A recent query on clinicaltrials.gov using the Boolean search terms stem cell and stroke yielded a total of almost 90 clinical trials, each at varying stages of recruitment. And of course, this is an exciting indication of the potential of stem cell therapies to enhance functional recovery after infarct. With this in mind, leaders at the forefront of these promising technologies recently convened to discuss the state of the science of cellular therapeutics for the treatment of stroke and also to discuss potential opportunities and obstacles. Key considerations that observed from this meeting uh, were outlined in this paper by Savitz et al. in 2014. And they included such considerations such as identification of the optimal candidate, candidate who will receive stem cell therapies. What is the best timing of the administration of these cellular therapeutics? And notably, the need to better understand what type of re uh, concomitant rehabilitation protocol should be applied to be most effective, how much of a rehabilitation protocol and at what timing. So one of the first projects supported by ART was led by Dr. Mike Moto in the Department of Radiology at the University of Pittsburgh. Using a rodent model of ischemic stroke, Mike and his team investigated the potential of a regenerative rehabilitation approach to enhance functional recovery after stroke. Specifically, uh, Mike and his team were investigating the potential synergy between stem cell therapy together with an exercise protocol, in this case, treadmill running at a moderate intensity. This study was extremely comprehen comprehensive and Mike and his group investigated a number of outcome variables ranging from structural to behavioral changes across the various groups. So here I'm showing just one of the outcomes tested, sensory motor uh, functional recovery. Um, however, the findings from this particular variable were very representative of many of the variables tested. Essentially, the way that this uh, test works is following the stroke, animals will uh, be, receive a tape on their paw. 
And it's essentially the time to initial contact and the time that it takes for the animal to remove the tape that is recorded. So the shorter the time, the better the recovery. And these are the data. Essentially, Mike and his team found that when compared to stroke alone, exercise resulted in a significant improvement, as expected. Cell transplantation alone also resulted in a, uh, in a benefit when compared to stroke. But the two administered together resulted in only a sub-additive effect, with the combination of the two therapies essentially having a dampening effect when compared to either intervention applied in isolation. In essence, a dissonant system. But should we conclude then that rehabilitation is not beneficial to enhance the efficacy of cellular therapies for stroke? Or instead, should we revisit the rehabilitation protocols that are employed in the clinic and attempt to more closely capture the context-dependent criteria that so often guide our clinical pra practice? Enter uh, Dr. R David Rankinsmeyer and Sunil Gandhi, art-funded investigators at the University of California, Irvine, who are developing a murine model of motor retraining using a rehabilitation robot. And this is a robot. So as you can see, uh, the mouse is uh, required to reach through a window in the plexiglass uh, panel and to reach a lever and pull it towards its body. Once it does so successfully, it receives a sugar water reward. Now, the, many of the, uh, the variables can be modulated with this rehabilitation robot, including the tension at which the animal needs to pull the lever, um, the distance at which the animal needs to reach um, before it can grab onto the lever and pull it back, and even the number of times that the lever needs to be pushed uh, before receiving that liquid water reward. And so the idea here is, again, to more, co uh, more closely mimic the specificity of rehabilitation practice and in a very context-dependent way. Incidentally, uh, Dr. Rankinsmeyer and his group um, currently have a, a postdoctoral position open um, specifically for uh, this rehabilitation, regenerative rehabilitation paradigm, and that is looking at the use of this robotic rehabilitator in conjunction with the stem cell therapy for the treatment of spinal cord injury. A very exciting opportunity. Dr. David Mooney and Connor Walsh at uh, the Harvard University and Wies Institute are taking a similar approach. And here they're investigating whether an ultrasound guided soft robot can enhance skeletal muscle regeneration after injury. Uh, so this is what the robot looks like. Um, what the group did is they built an external device that is capable of applying cyclical uh, loading to the injury site, and it can do, such, do so with varied parameters. So this electromagnetic pump-based actuator stimulates the injured limb and is combined with ultrasound imaging. And so they can do real-time monitoring of, uh, of how much tissue strain is applied to the injured tissue. And that is essentially this graph that you can see here with increased loading force by the robotic actuator resulting in a, an increase in um, uh, tissue strain. And what they found is when they applied the cyclical loading to the injury site, then uh, there was a significant enhancement in the functional recovery of the injured muscle after two weeks. So together, these studies serve as just a sampling of work that aims to translate advances in the mechanosensitivity of stem cells at the cellular and molecular levels into therapeutically meaningful approaches in the clinic. But a question that I can't help but wonder is, is it really necessary and logical to stop there? Or can we dig down even deeper, perhaps even down to the atomic scale? The now emerging field of quantum biology represents the convergence between quantum mechanics and biology, a convergence that has foundations in the increased recognition that biological systems are, to a significant extent, rooted in the quantum world. This includes phenomena such as electron spinning, superposition, and entanglement. In many ways, a quintessential example of the relevance of quantum phenomena applied to biological systems is found in this animal here, the European robin. For many years, the ability of this bird to migrate hundreds of kilometers south to a precise location has eluded and confused scientists. And it's been only relatively recently that investigators have been able to prove what once seemed impossible. 
And that is that these animals are able to sense and respond to alterations in the Earth's geomagnetic field. And the means by which they do this seems to be anchored in the uh, action of quantum phenomena. These intriguing findings have implications for a wide range of species that are similarly magnetosensitive, including humans. Because indeed, very recent work suggests that humans may possess magnetosensitive capabilities. Uh, this paper was recently published by investigators at Caltech University, who constructed a modified Faraday cage to test whether humans may be able to sense subtle alterations in the Earth's magnetic field. So they applied coils on the outside of this cage, and these coils elicited magnetic fields at intensities on the order of the Earth's magnetic field that is between 25 to 65 micro Tesla. They then shifted the orientation of the magnetic field, the polarization of the magnetic field, all while monitoring brain responses using electroencephalography. What they observed were strong, specific, and repeatable brain, brain responses to shifts in these geomagnetic fields. Further supporting the hypothesis that indeed humans possess a certain extent of sensitivity to these extremely low um, magnetic fields. The implication of these, this line of research, I believe, is intriguing because these studies serve as an important proof of principle that quantum phenomena have the potential to regulate cell and molecular responses, even within the warm and wet environment of a biological system. Inspired by these findings, my lab has now been partnering with a multi multidisciplinary team of investigators compri comprising theoretical and experimental physicists, chemists, and bioengineers. And together, we are investigating whether quantum principles may dictate stem cell behavior. That is, much as the bird uses the Earth's magnetic field to direct its migration, we are asking whether and how stem cells may exploit endogenous magnetic fields within our bodies to direct migration and homing to an injury site. And we're probing the role of quantum phenomena in these responses. While we anticipate that these, um, line of this line of investigation may enhance our understanding of the biological mechanisms underlying tissue healing um, and, and the tissue regenerative cascade, what we're most excited about is the potential of this work to one day lead to the development of novel regenerative rehabilitation modalities such that, for example, uh, magnetotherapies can be used in conjunction with cellular therapeutics. Ultimately, we hope that this might add quantum biology to the regenerative rehabilitation toolbox. At the end of the day, it seems clear that there is enormous potential to coordinate the state-of-the-art advances from our field with those of our neighbors. And the idea is that if we can get it just right, well, then we anticipate that something truly powerful and impactful may emerge. With that, I would like to thank you for your time and I welcome any questions you may have.